Greetings and welcome to the final round table of what has been a most rewarding symposium. Our thanks go to Mariette Westerman and Manuel Rabate for conceptualizing the event and to Anaisa Gare and her team for running it under challenging circumstances. I'm Andrew McClellan and I'm delighted to moderate this panel devoted to the future of the curator. Through the 20th century, museums revolved around their collections. Arguably at most art museums, the preservation and acquisition of objects were prioritized above education and outreach. As managers of those collections, Curators, who are also known as keepers and conservateurs, were positioned at the top of museum hierarchies. It was from the ranks of curators that museum directors were chosen, and for the most part still are. The strength of museums and careers of directors and curators were measured by the quality of artworks they acquired. But toward the end of the century, at least in the United States, museums began to experience a significant shift in priorities. Neatly summed up by the theorist Stephen Weil, as a transformation in institutional emphasis from being about something to being about for somebody. In other words, a shift from objects to visitors. That transformation entailed questions about who constituted the museum publics and how objects could attract and serve them. Changing demographics and financial pressures were added to the mix and have since been further complicated by a global recession, rising social justice movements, demands for repatriation, accelerating digital technology and new entertainment platforms and now a devastating pandemic. All of which leads us to ask, what are the responsibilities of the curator today and tomorrow? Do those responsibilities differ from one country to the next? How is the profession changing? And what training do students entering the field today require? What challenges lie ahead, but also what opportunities? We will get to these questions and perhaps others, including questions from you, the global audience, in the final half hour of our conversation. So those of you watching from around the world, please submit questions and we will answer as many as we can. One question it is premature to answer fully is the impact of COVID-19 on the curatorial field. We do know, however, that there have already been furloughs, early retirements, and layoffs. And students looking for their first job have had to put those hopes on hold. And so if museums are temples of empathy, as we heard yesterday, let us think empathetically about those curators and other museum workers whose lives have been affected. With us today to offer a range of perspectives on the future of the curator are five distinguished speakers who I would like to introduce briefly in alphabetical order. And I hasten to add that a fuller profile of each speaker may be found on the symposium webpage. Reem Fada is an award-winning curator and art historian who has organized international exhibitions across the Middle East and North Africa, and has served as curator at the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi and as director of the Palestinian Association for Contemporary Art. She is currently director of the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi. Thelma Golden has also won prestigious awards for curatorial excellence and leadership. Based in New York, Thelma has worked at the Whitney Museum and at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she is currently director and chief curator. She is also a member of the Barack Obama Foundation Board of Directors. Sophie Macariou is director of the Musée Guimet in Paris. Previously, she was curator in the Department of Near Eastern Antiquities at the Louvre 
and was responsible for inaugurating the Louvre's Department of the Arts of Islam in 2012. Jessica Morgan is the Natalie de Gunsberg Director of the DIA Art Foundation in the United States, which she joined after gaining broad curatorial experience on both sides of the Atlantic at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and Tate Modern in London. And last but not least, Rosemary Musso came to the Louvre Abu Dhabi as chief curator of early modern art in 2018, following a remarkable career as curator of archaeology at the Musée Carnavalet in Paris, curator of the catacombs too, I suppose, and director and chief curator of decorative arts at the Musée Cognac J, also in Paris. So together as a panel, you have amassed extraordinary curatorial expertise and leadership experience. One couldn't ask for a better set of commentators, and I'm honored to moderate the following discussion. So let's get started. Because you represent different types of institutions and different cultural contexts, I think it would be interesting to begin by asking each of you the same two-part question. What excites you about the future of curating in your field and in your area, and what is your biggest concern about the future of curating? Reem, may I ask you to go first, please? Sure. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this conference and thank you for the organizers for a great three days. Um, and of course, an honor to be with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I've ruminated around a, lo a lot of these ideas, uh, Andrew, and I was thinking, uh, particularly about the opportunity that we're seeing now at large in the world, uh, thinking of the curator not just as a mitigator of a space or an exhibition area, but largely someone who's an interlocutor with society, with civic spaces, and that responsibility to carry that voice into uh, public institutions, very public institutions. Um, that is something that has become a great opportunity. We are further enforced with the voices of the people from all over the world, demanding equity, responsibility from these institutions and parity on a lot of subject matters, representation, storytelling, um, and further enforcement, and I would say in, uh, um, enabling for political discourses and civic engagement in our institutions. So this is a, a I think the potential is huge. Um, uh, I think this is uh, something we're all being very responsive to, um, uh, responsive to the variety of our audiences, the diversity of our audiences. And, uh, uh, and I think definitely the curator has a main role to be that arbiter, to think within that kind of larger public space. Um, where I have concerns is this powerful linking of the political and the cultural together and the artistic together um, has created a voice that, as I said, is really powerful. But at the same time, I'm worried that we, within the reality of COVID, with the reality that people are losing their jobs, where there will be further marginalization towards cultural institutions. And there will be a demand for, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, I wanna say kind of neoliberal practices being uh, enforced on public institutions to support themselves, to diversify their incomes, where then we become again agents uh, that fall into the language, into the neoliberal language in, and, uh, and become kind of administrators more than what, what we really have the potential to be, which are really kind of cultivators of a, a larger discussions with our uh, society. So these are the challenges that I think are at hand. Um, and we really need to think in ways that can push back uh, think creatively, but also keep our eye on the main uh, goal. That's great. Thank you so much, Reem. Uh, Thelma, may I ask you to offer some comments? 
Yes, well, first again, thanks and gratitude to all involved in putting this together and how wonderful it is to be here today with the fellow panelists and this audience uh, from near and far. Um, Andrew, to your question about what excites me, it is that I come from a tradition of curatorial practice that is linked deeply to ideas of equity and community and culture. One that sees the museum as not simply a repository of objects, but an active space for a kind of cultural equity, and more specifically, one that speaks to these larger ideas of humanity. So what excites me now is that these are ideas that are being embraced widely and understanding this role of curatorial practice, even in the institution, as having to be a role that is involved in transformation, not just the sort of maintaining of a kind of status quo. Um, I think that the challenge is, is that I also sort of steward a tradition um, here in the United States that has seen this history before and has seen this sort of agency towards change before and watched it then go away. So the challenge at this moment is how do we make the action of this moment? How do we make this sense of agency? Right? How do we create the possibility for this conversation not to be episodic, not to be reactionary to the events of the last six, eight, 12 months, but how do we create lasting, sustained change in the institutional context? And how do we rethink curatorial practice where we think of this as an important aspect of that practice that stands alongside the sort of exhibition making, preservation, interpretation work, which of course, course, is so important to all of us as we see the privilege of what it means to work with artists and objects. Great, fantastic. You're already raising so many interesting issues. We'll see if we can follow up on some of those. Uh, Sophie in Paris, hello. Hello. Well, uh, well, of course, my perspective is maybe a little bit different, but not that much. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I've uh, spent all my career in national museums. So the situation in France is very different as the situation, for example, in the States. Uh, there are not a lot of uh, threats on the museum. We have to be clear about that. We are, we are very lucky. And I think it's important uh, to say that. And it's important to underline that we can st still be optimistic. Well, usually I'm optimistic. I've been trained so in, uh, in Paris. I've been, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a young curator in the department uh, linked to uh, the nearest. Uh, and then I was lucky to create the department of the de dedicated to Islamic art in the loop. So it's, it means I've been working all my life on culture, which is supposed to be foreign cultures. And I'm now the, the, the president of the, of the National Museum in French, which is, which is dedicated to, uh, to the arts of Asia. Well, uh, the first uh, question is, what is exciting me in the future? Well, I, I, I may answer in one strange word, danger. And I think that danger uh, is a big stimulation to create something new. Uh, we will have to adapt to a very um, difficult situation, it's pretty sure. But it's also a good occasion of trying to be more creative, more open. Uh, in this museum, the Guimet National Museum uh, for Asian Art, uh, we used to repeat a sentence of our founder, uh, Emile Guimet, who was an industrialist and a philanthropist. He used to say uh, there are two types of... Uh, of um, of scholars, there are scholars who held the curtain and they, they close the curtain. And there are scholars who, who make holes in the curtains. I do like to make holes in the curtains. I do think maybe this situation will lead, will, will lead us to uh, create all in the curtains. The only reply for me uh, to what, what we are going through is to be more open-minded than we were uh, I totally uh, agree with uh, with Reem when she said that um, we are inter interlocutor with the society. We are a political link in the society. I do think we have to work on that. 
uh, we are facing and we are maybe a kind of screen of very important questions in, in our world. Uh, we are dealing with the, conversa with the uh, conservation of memory, works of art, beauty, uh, political engagement, sustainability, and all that. So it's a very challenging period. I do think that we have to uh, be clear about the fact that a museum is a kind of a forum or an agora, and we have to accept it. The more we will accept it, the more we'll try to create things, the more powerful we will be. You are totally re uh, right, Riva, when you say that also this political pressure or this political link that we uh, we can enact is very uh, challenging it's a, it's a luck but it's also a danger but i do think also it's a it's a it's a luck for us it's a luck because in so many museums it will put light also on cultural institution we are not a repository for objects we are not uh, desk places we are those agora where all the social questions will enter very soon and that's already entered our museum it's global conversation it's the i would say the balance between the different types of culture uh popular culture uh popular culture versus a more scholar approach sustainability and all that i do think that uh, it's our big luck. I don't think the period, and but I'm also speaking from a, a very happy uh, perspective, as we are not losing jobs for the moment in in, uh, in French museums because we are all public institutions, and we are only functioning not only but we are mainly functioning on public money. So I do insist we are very lucky. So I do think it's our role really to project ourselves in those, uh, I would say, uh, in, in this um, ocean of, of question that we will have to face. And we have to accept it and we have to work deeply on the connection of, the, of, the, of our working uh, uh, net. Good, thank you very much, Sophie. Jessica. Thank you, Andrew. And, and um, thanks to everybody who's organized this. And I'm also incredibly honored to be with my incredible female colleagues here today. Um, so I, I truly think that one of the most exciting changes that we're seeing um, in our field is the increasingly collaborative, if not outright united fields of education and curatorial. Um, as we move towards what you were describing, Andrew, this increasingly people-centric focused institutions rather than the outdated notion of spaces for study and the preservation of objects and recognize really the true social significance of our work, which we're hearing from everybody today. Um, this definition of both curatorial and education redefinition is, is really energizing. Um, I think both departments are undoubtedly involved in, creative, in creating creative content. They're working closely with and supporting artists and both have the ultimate ambition of engaging with our communities in new ways. Um, I think one of the, the sort of fascinating consequences of this and, and exciting consequences is really that there's also a reevaluation of what it is required to be a curator. Um, the PhDs and MAs in the traditional fields of art history will potentially become less relevant. And I think with that comes a, a really all important opening up of our field for diverse voices whose you know, varying background skills and knowledge will be needed to address a more people-focused culture. Um, what are the, the things I'm most concerned about? I, th I think it's really that we'll fail to evolve. Um, there are seismic changes taking place in contemporary culture and in our societies. And if we don't evolve, um, we will become redundant. Well, I hope to come back to this issue of training. I think there are a lot of people out there who are quite curious to to imagine, to, to hear from you what, what you imagine the future in that regard uh, holds. But thank you for that, Jessica. Excellent. Uh, and last but not least, Rosemarie. Yeah, first of all, of course, thanks to, to all the organizers for this uh, moment and uh, this discussion, which is so important today. Um, imagining the future of curators is a bit restrictive, as all the panelists have mentioned, because, of course, what the crisis that we have faced 
And the main question, which is uh, finally, are we still the bridges that can link the relationship between the civilization and as well the past and the present is really re-raised today. This question of education for me is really modeling this aspect. We, we should, we, we, we are evolving and above all in Abu Dhabi, which is a kind of cosmopolitanism platform where you have, uh, uh, for instance, when, you are, when I am looking at my uh, daughter's school, there are, uh, there are 146 nationalities together. Uh, here in Louvre Abu Dhabi, we are 36 nationalities. It's always a kind of, a, let's say, a micro-global approach on all these elements and all these bridges around the cultures. But uh, as I told you, my main fear at some point is really on focusing on the local aspect and, at, and just uh, removing all this, um, let's say, link that we have in between us. Uh, removing all this, uh, and we have all heard about this empathy, this social, this physical link that we have shared this contact with the artworks that are so important to do this question of sensoriality and sensitive aspects that you can uh, cultivate uh, for that. So yeah, uh, I think we are living in challenging times for that and just for reconnecting completely with the meanings of this object uh, from the physical, historical, deep historical point of view and as well from the contemporary point of view. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, there was a lot in there about engagement, about transforming the museum into an active space and an interlocutor with, uh, with society. Uh, you all seem completely on board with the idea that the model of curating is, is shifted decisively away from a sort of an older model of looking after things to engaging those things uh, and their publics. Uh, obviously, we're different, dealing with different uh, cultural landscapes, you know, in, in state supported systems, you have a lot more protection and leeway perhaps and in, in, uh, in private systems more like the United States, uh, the issue of uh, revenue and supporting the institution, Reem's comment about administration, these pose challenges, I think, to the creative uh, work that you all got into the field to, to pursue in the first place, I, I imagine. The, the issue that Jessica and Thelma raised about the, the sort of the, the, the challenge of sustaining transformation and the challenge of the failure, the possible failure to evolve uh, is, is something you know, we should think about. And, and why is that? Why, why have things failed to evolve? What are the, the, the obstacles to uh, sustaining transformation? Uh, big questions and go into you know, societal issues that we may or may not uh, uh, address, but I don't know, maybe we can, uh, I'd be curious actually to just to perhaps hear a little bit more about, you know, if, if transformation is so important, if activation and social engagement are so important, what are the uh, obstacles to sustaining that kind of transformation? What have you experienced in the way of, of, of challenges and obstacles to, to you know, uh, sustain change? Well, if I may speak first from a French point of view, uh, well, of course, I, I imagine for all my colleagues, it will be very different. Uh, I would say that uh, in French national museums, maybe the biggest, biggest obstacle will be uh, certainly the, well, the frame, the administrative frame. So the, 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 the burden of administration taking yeah, away from yeah, creating yeah. capacity. You know, we, we, we are French. We love to have frames. We love to have a, uh, everything so well fixed. But I do think that what is challenging, and for me what is exciting, I must say, is that you have to destroy something to build another thing. And it's exactly the moment we are facing, the moment we are going through. I'm pretty sure that something which I've you know, we are all thinking in a, in a, um, uh, with a, a scale of time. And of course, the scale of time is first our life. So we, we all think that what we are experiencing is eternal. I do think that there is a big shift with it, which is really happening right now, a big historical moment, which, which will introduce a big change in the history of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. I'm pretty sure about that. There are two ways to react, or you accept the idea and you work with the idea, or you try to, uh, to work against the idea. I do think the right way of reacting is, 
is using the obstacle. I'm pretty sure that now, uh, at one point, there will be so many threats, so, ma so much economical pressure on the future of museum that we will have to reinvent totally something, including the way we are doing and we are thinking about exhibition. We have been uh, brought up in a, in, a, in a world where it was easy to make big exhibition, you know, you, you had works of art coming from all around the world. Well, let's think in a more local way. Let's think in a more sustainable way. So I do not think what is happening only as a, uh, as a problem. I, I, I see it really as a kind of challenge. But the biggest obstacle is our way of thinking. You know, the fact that we are, well, I'm speaking from a French point of view, an old culture. So we have old habits. The big problem is habits. The big, uh, uh, the big problem is, is thinking fresh. Even you know, in museums are old institutions. They, they come from places, they're traditional. So making change, uh, I suppose, is gonna be uh, slow work in any case. But Andrew, uh, yes. I might add, if I might add that, you know, speaking um, from my experience as the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York City, is that we were founded not necessarily in a way that was about simply making change. It was about creating new models. And I think that what this moment proposes is again that possibility. Um, yeah. You know, in 1969, when this country was going through incredible social tumult and this sort of um, conversation around what museums were, but more specifically what they were not, right, already bound to their traditions, this idea of creating new institutions, new models, new ways of working and redefining them was a way to create change. And so I think that this moment, if we think of opportunity, and I know some of us also represent institutions that are not so old, that it is about this kind of reinvention of models and the proposal that these new models are not simply reactions to something that existed, but potentially creating new paths. Thank you. Thelma. I just wanted to add um, on the issue of uh, struggle as well. I, I mean, I've worked with several institutions and museum and museum building projects. And now I work with a multi kind of disciplinary cultural institution at the same time. But I think part of the problematic that we're all facing also as curators is that we are facing a tide, a really kind of strong, I want to say rooted tide, that's something that Thelma's alluding to, uh, which is very object centric. It, and it has a kind of material, art and creative language has gone strong ahead, right? It's gone way ahead. Virtual practices, we're seeing collaborative ideas, we're seeing collective solidarities, uh, you know, models of uh, artists coming together and thinking, and not just artists, I mean, artists in all disciplines coming together and putting them in applicable even uh, projects. So uh, take, for example, example, uh, forensic architecture, uh, the, the collaborative architectural artistic group and how they've applied it to specifically kind of political language through use of, use of architectural studies and analyses, except language curatorial. How are we adapting? And how are we allowing that new voice of art, that which is not just the painting since 300 years ago, speak to this new forum and speak to these new ideas and the urgency that they represent? This is something that I think is the, the real kind of challenge because it's also beholden to market patrons. You know, there's a huge thing that is tied to this, uh, to this uh, larger culture that is, you know, tied to the idea of the object. So we need to tread, as Thamo was mentioning, these new models. How do we start to engage them, present them, and forge a new path for this new language? Thank you, Reem. I think what, what seems to be emerging is the question of what today uh, um, constitutes curatorial expertise. I mean, the 
uh, talk about collaboration, moving towards more social engagement, the complexity of the museum scene overlaps with the market and, and all other forces. Uh, you know, I, several years ago, there was a, an article in the Wall Street Journal that announced that today everybody is a curator, which seemed to question the professional standing and the authority of, of, of curators. And some of what you're saying here touches on this question, well, what is it to be a curator today? Uh, would you care to just address what you think constitutes curatorial work today? And is there a loss of professional standing and a, a threat to the authority of the curator in the museum? Would anyone like to answer that question or? Uh, I'd happily jump in, Andrew. Um, I mean, I think, um, and this is really coming uh, out of, of what Reem's saying as well. I mean, I think traditionally this idea that curators have been, you know, devising exhibition concepts, um, selecting artists and works, writing catalogs, managing collections. Um, I mean, for that type of work, a deep art historical knowledge was, was always deemed to be required. And I, I think to some extent, it's also al always been somewhat overrated. I mean, speaking personally, I don't think I've ever had a job where in fact my art historical training was directly related to, to what I do. So um, this idea of actually, you know, what can be gained, let's say on the job, I think is the thing that has always been underestimated and that um, you're growing as you're within a position. Um, it comes back, I guess, to my point before about what, how we, you know, how we're hiring and selecting curators and what we consider to be the fundamental um, qualities in order for them, as we're saying, to articulate a, a, a social and political um, environment within, within our cultural institutions, um, which, are, you know, it's not only through works of art, but also design and the sort of breadth of practice that Reem is describing, um, but equally public engagement. Um, you know, what, what, is, what is the role of a curator now, I think, has, has so significantly shifted that we have to look for very different qualities, skills, backgrounds, um, and, and new models, really. Anyone else? Yeah, if I may jump on it, I fully agree. It's not only a question of deep knowledge of art history, it's a part of it. In, in uh, Of course, I'm coming from a classical background as well of fine arts. Um, and for me, it's really important when I am displaying an object to know it and to understand the many threads that are behind it. Because if I want to collaborate, if I want to, to, to speak, and if I want to transmit something, I have to have this element. But of course, it's not enough. And you have to have this generosity that we have mentioned. We have to have this consciousness as well of what is happening around us. We are not a, a secluded people living just like uh, uh, elements with books and, uh, and things like this. It's not like this. It's, uh, if you cannot display properly something, if you have not this, uh, let's say, full consciousness of all the debates that are surrounding any elements of that, or even the, the evolution of a society. So for me, it's, it's not you, you see one part and the other one, the academic and the other elements. It's really a whole uh, aspect about, uh, about uh, this thing. Would it be fair to say that, that the, a knowledge of, of objects and of art history remains an important consideration within the curatorial practice, but it's no longer sufficient? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it's right if I uh, can follow up on that. Uh, you know, there are about suppose about uh, the level of museums and the perception of museums by the public. What is very strong is that there is a very high uh, feeling of uh, of trust into museums. I would say we are serious places, and I do think it's important when we speak what we what we say is supposed to be fair and right. And we have to share and to, to care for that. I think it's very important. It means we are perceived, in France at least, in a totally dis different perspective than, for example, uh, people working for a newspaper. So uh, we are, it, it, the fact of opening the museum toward the society is very important. But we do have to care really for the high uh, esteem of the audience toward the knowledge which is bring and used in the museum. That is part of the treasure of the museum. If we lose that, we will lose a lot of things. 
And Andrew, I, I don't think the question is about the training in art history. I think for those of us whose work has always been about a reformation of the canon, art history is an important tool, right? The engagement with art history, because the desire is to expand that art history. It is more about what it means to be in an institutional context and serve a public and what skills are necessary. And I think that this combination of curatorial skills, but understanding that our ability to function in ways that engage education, community engagement, and even administration in a way to serve the ability to have a museum space that represents and fully engages art and artists in all ways. That's what I think perhaps when we talk, I certainly when I think about young curators and speak to them, it really is about that expanded field, not an either or around the training, but more a sense of how we um, can understand our skills in a way that is serving a larger goal of expanded, open, inclusive, disruptive institutional spaces. You have complicated, multifaceted jobs, don't you? Yeah, uh, and, and I'll just attempt to answer as well, because um, I, I don't think it's an, an issue of just uh, uh, authorship, um, uh, because I, I've always thought of myself at, at, in my ability as a curator, as someone who's always conducting conversations. I've loved the model of thinking of myself Self in, uh, in an aspect where I'm reactive to everything that is around me. I'm not just, you know, I'm someone who's, you know, uh, yes, the material object speaks to me, uh, but the artist speaks to me, my society speaks to me, the newspaper is relevant to me. All of these elements really kind of create that larger conversation that never stops. So all of these things, this phenomenological order is something that I try to inhabit, represent at any given moment of time. Uh, this conversation is a requirement. Uh, I think I've always thought of ourselves uh, in terms of, uh, in the model of thinking of a curator, in the same kind of political order where, um, uh, where constituents need to speak to their people, right, to their representatives. So this is exactly this kind of enabling way that we have a voice to, to further cre create uh, stories and everything that re is represented around it. Another thing that I really firmly believe in, and, and people sometimes tell me that I have a little bit too much of uh, maybe passion or, but I really think that we are also people who work to create institutions of care. This is something that is really essential. How are we starting to really kind of implement this empathy, this care in the voice of our institution, this connectivity, this care, and this conversation that is, uh, it, it, is a, a fundamental thing. And the last thing that I think is very important, we are knowledge makers. So where you get that knowledge and how, uh, how broad that knowledge could be makes it for a far more interesting conversation. And that's something that I firmly believe in. And of course, not dismissing history, be it art history or social history or any kind of history. Um, in the end of the day, we need to build on foundations. Thank you, Reem. Thank you. So where does one, what do you say to students who are entering the field? You know, that's a, it's a really complicated job that you have and you add into the mix the burden of administration and fundraising in many cases, and you've got a complicated profile. So how do students get there? I mean, Jessica, you, 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 you wondered about the overvaluation of PhDs and the traditional route into the field, but is that still where you need to start or, or what, what do young people do? Well, I think I do think that um, you know the the broadening of where we are um, looking to find younger curators needs to happen. You know, I I still think there's a a very restricted view of those coming through curatorial programs, those coming through um, PhD or MA art historical programs. You know, some of the most talented people I've worked with have come from completely different backgrounds, whether it's well, completely within the arts, architecture, science, philosophy, um, but they could also be coming. I, I have worked and work with incredible curators who come from a background of dance, they're practitioners. Um, they're literally, you know, they're coming from making into um, an understanding of, of precisely what it means to be um, relating to a public. I mean, their work was entirely about producing work for a public. So I think, uh, you know, having a much more expansive view, uh, that 
not to you know even mention the the sort of digital field and how important that is for our environment and knowledge of that. Um, I just think there are so many different ways in which we can enter what we do. And I come back to this idea of learning on the job. I mean, I, I've learned an enormous amount through practice, not through um, my educational training. I wonder, though, if, Jessica, your perspective comes from a more contemporary viewpoint. And if you are entering into a museum like Sophie's or the Louvre, whether you need historical information, when part of your job is to simply steward collections which aren't going away and which need to be revitalized in some way. You know, is it the case that you, in some museums, it's more important than in others? Quite true, although I do think that you, it, there, it's absolutely fundamental to have new, new means of telling stories. And again, that comes back to very different backgrounds. It could be design, it could be within um, choreography again. I mean, I, I think, the, the skill set is still a very broad one. Yeah. Well, I do think that uh, I, I will, I don't know how to say that into English. Someone may help me. Um, there is a word that I like very much in French and I, and that I use to define what should be a curator nowadays, which is un mouton à cinq pattes. I don't know, Rosemary, if you have any way of translating it. Uh, just to be something like an animal with so many, uh, just like, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. so many, so many I think hands. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, a, a mouton à cinq pattes. I think it's exactly what we have to be. Of course, I do think that training in art history is very important. But what is more important maybe is, is to be able to be fed by, uh, to be fed by, by many, many differences. I'm sensitive to... Uh, for example, CV of people who have been training in other fields too. And they do add many, many interesting points of view to a museum. I think it's, it's, it will be more and more relevant in the future. I, I, I also, that, Thomas, go ahead, please. I just wanted to simply add that I also think that our institutions um, need to become more open to the idea of multiple points of entry for actual experience. I think, you know, many institutions privilege internships, which is fantastic, but we don't always privilege other points of entry that allow people into the field. And that's where the narrow road can come from, right? Because it can feel as if only those young people who are coming straight through art history, through graduate programs, then end up at the entry level. And that's what also makes the field um, in the US not very diverse at all, right? So multiple points of opportunity, real opportunity that allows people to be supported in their work and in their experience, which then allows them a path into the field and also creates an environment that sustains their work moving, moving forward. I suppose that requires leadership that is open-minded enough to start that process. No, completely. And I think for, you know, those of us who came into the field that way, we understand its importance that, you know, the opportunity for institutions to think of themselves, you know, again, when we talk about this idea of the museum, but as, you know, active opportunities for training, for experience, for engagement, and also in the care of young professionals as they enter this field and offering them a path as they move through the field as well. Can I shift ground and, and uh, ask a question that I think is on the minds of many people out there uh, to do with repatriation and deaccessioning, two hot button issues that uh, you know, have been around for a while and aren't going to go away anytime soon. And just to ask, uh, in, in this current moment, when it's on the minds of so many institutions, what role curators have to play in the process of repatriating objects, deaccessioning objects. Would anyone like to start with that? <laughs> it's, really, it's, really a, it's really an uncomfortable question because uh, of my accent is speaking for me. I'm coming from a French background as well. And uh, for us, uh, this question of uh, act of collection is really important because it's a, uh, to, to acquire uh, an artwork with some kind of eternity in mind because it's a part of, uh, it's really a part of the narrative of any museum. It's really a part of his DNA at some point. So 
Is deaccessioning is really raising this point at some point? A uh, question: When you are deaccessioning something, could you just have the mirror hearing effect that when you are acquiring something, but at the same time you are um, removing uh, an element of the past, an element which is really a part of the story of this institution? So, of course, this is a question that uh, has to be raised. But yes. Um, I think you, you are missing this part of, uh, of eternity when you are uh, uh, losing that. And at the same time, I know that in USA, because it has been put, and really, I think it's really related with uh, a lot of elements in, in, uh, that, uh, that have uh, appeared into, into USA during the last uh, that month. It's really related uh, at some point to the, the social context. And uh, you have mentioned this, uh, this uh, terrible crisis and its effect uh, on the real people behind uh, the artworks, the people who are carrying them as well. So, yeah, I think uh, it's really difficult to just uh, balance all these elements. It's both a part of this history of the institution. Well, if I may, I may go on uh, after uh, what Rosler has said, is that, well, first, uh, of course, there are very different situations, uh, which are also legal situations, which are very different. I think what would be very dangerous would try to have a simple answer, uh, try to be too global, uh, because we are dealing with uh, very different topics, with uh, different moments of history of sensitivity and so on. I would, I would only quote someone who is a former ambassador of Afghanistan into France. He just went back to, uh, to Kabul a few months ago. And just before leaving uh, and paying a visit again to the museum, he sent me a very, very kind and elegant letter. And he was finishing his letter stating that Afghan people were, and French people were lucky to have such a museum as the Guimé Museum, which have a huge collection of works of art coming from the Gandhara, which went through uh, um, archaeological excavations. And it was so important for uh, Afghan people to see them so well preserved in Paris, so cleverly presented. And it's, it was also a luck for um, uh, for um, uh, French people, of course, and all foreigners coming to Paris in normal time. Well, I do think that that museum is about sharing. When you have a, a collection of uh, works coming from the Gandhara in Paris, it means a lot of people have an access to it. Maybe we will have our biggest concern if to give more and more access, but also to preserve. What was underlying, of course, this very beautiful letter uh, written in French by the, the, the former uh, ambassador uh, of Afghanistan in France was that, of course, having pieces of this kind in Paris is, the, uh, is a way of assuring that there will still be a, a memory of what was Afghanistan somewhere in the world. You have to keep in, white, in mind what happened in 1996 in the Kabul National Museum, where two, more than 2,000 works of art have been destroyed, crushed into pieces by the Taliban. So, I mean, the museums are, are not only we have not to be naive about that. A museum is not only the result of a theft. Well, it's the result of passion, of love, of a, a, a big um, will of sharing knowledge, knowledge and love of the world, of an open world. Well, I'm half Cypriot. My father was born in Cyprus. Should, should I be interested only in the history of Cyprus but because my name is Makariu? Well, I, my name is Makariu, so I had created the Department of Islamic Art in the Louvre. I wanted to cross the frontier. And it's all that, the history of museum. If we reduce our museum to the small scale of, our, of, our, of the smallest element in humanity, we will lose something. I do think that bringing Greek art into Africa, for example, organizing exhibition of Greek art into Senegal or Roman art of what you want is maybe more important than only to say, 
to young people in Africa, well, you are African. Of course, they're African. Okay. But they belong to, 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 to a, a huge history, to a world history. Let's share the world history. I do think it's also what was the aim of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which is such a fantastic museum. What about, thank you, uh, Sophie. Uh, would any of you who are working more in the contemporary field, the modern field, care to comment about the current uh, thorny issue of deaccessioning, of losing certain pieces of the collection in order to increase the diversity of uh, the representation within the collection? I know it's a controversial topic, but I, it, it, and saying Andrew, that I'd, I'd like to. Oh, sorry, sorry. Saying that, just I wanted to say that I've disaccessioned very discreetly something. Only okay. to close the subject. Andrew, I, I thought it'd be interesting to open this up also to, um, you know, a topic that I think um, is really core here. Sophie raised. Um, the, the key question for all of us as well around resources and, and climate change, which is the exhaustive nature of our collections and actually the absurd nature of our collections. I mean, this, this kind of relentless acquiring that has resulted in institutions with, um, as we know, 3%, 2% of their collections on view and this massive storage of works unseen by anyone, let alone the origin country from which it was stolen. Um, so I think one of the key questions for us going forward is around sharing collections, whether it's to do with the co-acquisition of works or whether it's to do an, with an extremely proactive program of thinking about how a collection can be shared. I mean, when I was at Tate, there was an extraordinary program of sharing the program um, with, with the nation, incredibly successful. And I think, you know, looking to models like this and thinking about ways in which we can um, open up our collections. I know Thelma is part of an initiative in the US as well. I think this is really absolutely essential. I mean, this idea of, uh, as we were describing, I mean, the identity of the museum comes from the collection. Yes and no, at a certain point where we're, we're all circling um, similar objects, um, sort of competing with each other, which is absurd um, for acquisitions, we should be thinking about a different model. And, and just to add on that topic, uh, um, uh, I, I, my feeling is also, you know, having had a lot of discussions with a lot of uh, museum directors who've had these m massive collections at the same time, and, um, and thinking about how much they've created an economical burden on the institution, and yes, representation and all of that. And when, when the, the question of repatriation comes from that angle, I worry because there's also another, it's like an unburdening to other, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's a very different question when a country re requests the repatriation of certain objects. Uh, th that agency has to come from, from that kind of aspect. But I think the repatriating from the, the end point of we just want to unburden ourselves, that's something that I really want to question because it also has implications economical and political implications to the host that will receive this. Um, in terms of deaccessioning, I think there is a very, that's not to say that I'm not with repatriation because, but it does have to come from the agency of the requester. Um, when it comes to deaccessioning, I think this is a very valuable um, and I'm for it because I think at this point in time, You've already heard me. The object is not the maker of the institution. We have to understand that there are important voices that require enabling staff, uh, uh, you know, diversifying collections and a lot of st structural uh, inequities within these institutions. And these are very important things that need a, for a reformulation entirely. So I'm f all for it. Thank you. Um, I think it, for, you know, it's such a complicated process. And as Sophie says, you know, it, it's a nuanced situation, one institution to the next, but it does seem that having curatorial expertise at the, in the middle of it to decide, well, which, uh, under what conditions do things go back? And uh, also understanding, well, what are the trade-offs between letting a piece of the collection go or a collaboration still require somebody to make those decisions at the heart of the institution. Maybe curators aren't the only ones, but 
it, you know, it seems that it still has to go through that portal at some point. Um, well, we're almost, uh, go ahead, Thelma, please. I was gonna say, and I think as we talk about curators in the future, they are going to have to bring this sort of sense of an ethical standard around collecting as a whole. Right? and think about that in the core of their work. I think the sort of way in which, again, another role of the way in which a collector could be valued is in their ability to acquire. Um, now, it's perhaps in thinking about the ways in which, you know, as Reem says, the object isn't at the center, but also different models for the way in which we understand in, in, in institutions our relationships to these objects and how a curator should be in those conversations. And that should be a way that a curator's authority is understood. Mm -hmm. uh, ethics seem to be so important. You know, it's a, when I look across the landscape of education, as far as I know it, you know, PhD programs and even most museum studies programs I know don't get into the subject of ethics. You know, what is it to be an ethical curator? What, what, are, what are museum ethics? You know, it's how to and, and research this and process that. So that seems to be something that uh, it would be helpful to change so that you aren't, Jessica, you said learning on the job. Yes, of course, there are going to be things that can only be learned on the job. But wouldn't it be helpful if, you know, art history and other forms of the humanities took on these questions of ethics so it wasn't all done as soon as you get to a place? Uh, I think we're all close to um, turning it over to some questions from uh, the outside. I, I you know, I, my, my own training is in the sort of historic early modern field. And one thing that I come concerned with, and I hope it's not just me that's perseverating on this issue, uh, has to do with what I see as a, 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 a potential risk to all of these large historic museums becoming increasingly irrelevant given the emphasis that we seem to feel on uh, contemporary art. That, again, may be my perspective, my own anxiety. Uh, but I'm wondering if, if, if there's a sense out there amongst you that the shift toward the contemporary does pose a challenge to older historic collections and what to do with them, how to make them relevant again to contemporary audiences. Tell me I'm wrong or... or, or, or <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. You're wrong. If you just look at, you know, still the value of historic objects and the representation of them in within museums themselves, I think they still garner a lot of uh, tenacity and representation and even a pull from audiences. And we're not dismissing that because, you know, people are, uh, they feel more, uh, let's say, comfortable with things that they know. And history is something people are, relate to and understand. And this is something that is, you know, very relatable to audiences, especially with the kind of, I would say, time gap. Uh, but I, I, I definitely feel that, you know, there, and we have to remind ourselves that artists don't dismiss history. And they, work with the historic object, the contemporary artist that is. So a lot of them do work inspired by uh, a historical object and by collections and you know, by the representations of these museums through this kind of history. Um, I can name already you know, dozens from the top of my head who have done that. Uh, and they keep that conversation alive to sustain the language of the importance of these art historical objects at the same time, um, and to value the context that they've come with and to frame them in relevance to, to today's topics and subjects. So I think that's an important thing for us to remind ourselves. Thank you, Reem. I'm, I'm relieved. Uh, anyone else have any comments on that before we turn over to questions? Well, good. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that, Reem, because I, I like the way you, you, you phrased that. So, so thank you. Otone, are you out there to help us with some questions from the global audience? Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, we have one question in the chat, uh, which says, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, Jessica, very interesting comment that contemporary curators require skills and qualities above and beyond a traditional formal training in art history. So can Jessica, Thelma, or any of the other speakers be more specific with which skills 
or qualities contemporary curators fundamentally require. And she also says, if we know what we need, maybe we can think about how to teach or train for this. Jessica, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thema wanted to jump in. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, I mean, I think I touched on a few of the, the different um, avenues, but also skill sets that I think can be brought to the position. Um, and certainly, you know, I think back to the, the beginning of this talk, I was addressing the really exciting um, movement of, of education and curatorial into um, you know, really a, a, a combined field as I see it. I mean, it's it's very uh, becoming increasingly hard to differentiate. And I think people coming from uh, learning um, are absolutely equipped in, in the, the skills that we're talking about in regard to um, moving between the fields of um, addressing object making, working with artists, um, and then dealing with our very diverse publics and thinking about how to um, explore the many different ways in which we can manifest that that process and that conversation and and the the, the way in which we um, uh, you know and hopefully continue to kind of experiment with with our you know anything from presentation to live work to digital work um, so I think that is one area that I think we'll see enormous change within or at least I, I certainly hope that we will continue to see enormous change in. Um, but I think there are still so many other ways in which one could enter this field. And I, I do think, I think perhaps Andrew, you said it, I think it's also you know, very much dependent on the people who are hiring. I, I think you know, so many questions come back to us about who, who we're hiring and why we're hiring them. And you know, our own capacity to really um, expand what is understood to be the, the, the sort of key criteria. There's a, it's a much longer conversation there, I think around HR and hiring practices, but Thelma. <laughs> Yes, and I'll add to that, that I think that um, perhaps most important in training to be a curator is equalizing what has often been seen in curatorial practice of the work speaking to the field, right? The writing, the presentation is to art historians, other curators, connoisseurs, and equalizing the idea of a training that allows curators to understand how to interpret and speak to a public and not seeing one as the province of, you know, again, what we call education or in interpretation or learning, but as equal. And in some cases, for some institutional contexts, more important given the audiences. So I think that shift in training is perhaps the most significant one, both in art historical training, but also in job training. I mean, I think it's incredibly important for curators to understand the role of artist educators, right? And be able to not only present their exhibitions, um, but be able to interpret them, right, to a public. And if that, I think if we see that shift in a fundamental way that is almost becomes a requirement, I think that would be a fundamental shift in, in the field. You know, I, I would just add that, you know, within the academy, there's been a long tradition of, of academics criticizing museums for not doing this or not doing enough of that. And I would say that, you know, uh, those of us in the academy are also extremely conservative in what we expect of our students and how we train them. So the idea of ethics and interpreting for a broad public, good luck trying to find that in a lot of doctoral programs. So change needs to happen uh, on our end too and to become more inclusive ourselves and who we take into uh, uh, higher education uh, if, if we really expect to sort of generate a broad sense of change across the field. Um, good, Atene, there's another question for us. Yeah, there's a question uh, similar to that about uh, the role of um, curators with exhibitions and saying curators undoubtedly have power in institutions. The biggest perhaps is that they have a voice. How can we ensure to use this power to make space for other voices within our own area of visibility and our own right to speak? And how can we ensure that these stories are told by those to whom they belong? Uh, similarly, you know, there's a question saying how do you share world history when you don't have the tool to access your own history? Hmm. 
Rosemary? Yeah, if I may, it's not a one-way uh, act or a one-way direction. It's not a top-down direction. When we are walking, we are walking uh, as openly as we can. So we are not uh, displaying things alone, generally, and today. This has become a really a curatorial practice to work with uh, other people and other curators to set up a historical, I'm still, well, I'm still speaking about, the, of course, the historical uh, uh, display or art historical display or archaeological display. And it's not a one way in the fact that as museum people, you are not alone, as I, as I was telling. You are not secluded into your office. You are speaking to all the people on the ground. You are speaking from the, from the, the, the people who are just uh, uh, looking at the artworks to the people who are manipulating the artworks. And for me, the main fact to empower the people, to really empower them, is to speak. Uh, we were, uh, uh, Telma mentioned the, the verbal aspect, which is not a written aspect. This verbal aspect is a, is a part of our daily life. That's why for me, it's not this one way effect. When you are speaking, when you have this verbal discussion, it's a two way discussion and sometimes a multiple ways discussion. Um, I, I can kind of try to answer this question. Um, a, uh, in terms of like, participating in, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, in larger conversations when we're trying to think of the exhibitions and representing uh, uh, the voices of artists that represent also communities. And I'm just going to give an example because from particularly my current work, working at the Cultural Foundation, where we are trying to think about uh, presenting exhibitions that are hosting narratives that are untold from the larger region um, in the Arab world. So back to this question of, you know, how do we also talk about marginalized voices? And at the same time, uh, for example, our upcoming exhibition is about one protagonist who'd never had a retrospective in his lifetime, Mohammed Shaba, who was very important in a, a school of art in Morocco, the Casablanca Art School, but importantly represented the voice of the craftsman, uh, you know, was an editor in a magazine. His, uh, his output, his cultural output was very important. He was a political protagonist. He was even incarcerated for his ideas. This person, you know, he really thought about indigeneity. How do you push for, forward the language of arts to be engaged with the community, with people, and you build on that. And for us, you know, thinking about that kind of exhibition opens doorways for working also uh, in, in something that here in Abu Dhabi, we're very, uh, you know, we, we work very closely with artisans, with crafts, with indigenous practices, and trying to kind of put that forward as well as a language of mainstream and, and cultivating that. And we work with younger artists and our younger communities. So this is something we're also hosting an exhibition on the Women Artist Collective from Jordan that, that were very influential from Fakhr and Nissa to uh, Ufam Yereza and many others. So thinking about that kind of all these voices that have not been heard, have not been told, and then how does their influence trickle down into your, your actual kind of social practice? Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and I, I think we have to remind ourselves that uh, I'm also involved in the project of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi here, and we're also building a collection that is thinking about representation and thinking about, you know, because we're building a collection from scratch, we're not inheriting a collection. We are able to try to create an equitable form of voices that represent that kind of, you know, what is our world order today? And where do we want to enable these voices to come heard uh, and become that voice emanating from Asia and from from the Gulf here in the UAE. Thank you, Bim. Anyone else like to comment on this? I'm wondering, you know, with institutions that some museums are, of course, uh, small museums uh, with a small staff and even large museums that have the aspiration to be global, you know, deal with cultures that go beyond the single expertise of anybody on the staff there, what, what should museums do? What should curators do if they're dealing with material that they may not have uh, their own form of expertise or their own voice to, to look after? Is there a way in which you can do a responsible job of inclusivity if you yourself don't have that, that skill set? 
I, I think it is possible, but it requires, again, thinking differently in institutions about collaboration. It means bringing and creating partnerships that value um, other expertise, but brings it into one's institution with authority. It means having cross institutional collaborations, right? Sometimes there are big encyclopedic museums where curators might not have particular expertise, but then there are culturally specific institutions where that is there. And that really dynamic, equitable partnerships can create the possibility for that. But it, it does um, require, again, thinking differently about how we engage as a community. It means looking outside of what these traditional uh, ways in which we've thought of the community and valued authority and expertise. And uh, just to answer on that question as well, uh, for example, we're thinking of a model of creating a commune, a, a, a curatorial commune that now with the COVID, you know, it's, it's a possibility for us to be able to, you know, have these conversations with curators any, in any kind of part of the world. So a commune of curators that kind of represent us, have conversations elsewhere and kind of feed us back in to our locales. I think that's also a model that can be easily applicable during this day and age. Mm -hmm. We're talking about collaboration within institutions across departments. We're talking about collaboration between institutions of different sorts. And we're talking about collaboration with stakeholder communities, perhaps beyond the curatorial realm. So that's the, you know, that's a kind of model of almost vulnerability we're talking about. It's a question of like acknowledging what you don't have yourself and understanding that it's important to fill those gaps in different ways. Sophie, I'm, I'm curious, uh, in Paris at the Musée Guimet, for example, you represent such a broad range of, of Asian cultures. And is there a tradition in France of reaching out to communities uh, in Paris and beyond in France to involve voices of, of the Korean population? Well, usually it's, not, it's, it's really not developed in France. We are trying to do it in the museums. Well, first, beginning with... Uh, with the members of the museum. I mean, you have a lot of people who work in, uh, in the museum, which of course are not curators. And I think the first step is to involve them. So we have been working with them uh, at the beginning of this year, making a lot of workshops with all the staff, everybody in the staff, which it, so it was very interesting for us. And now we have, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, lockdown, we have, uh, launched a new program, which we call the Voices of the NAG, NAG is, uh, is our name, uh, the Voices of the Musée National des Arts Asiatiques Guimet. So we invite every member of uh, our staff to, to uh, choose a, a text dealing with Asia or speaking about Asia and to have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to broadcast it and uh, so it, we are creating a collection of the voices of the museum. And it's very important for me, you know, to have all the way of speaking, to say to every members of the, of the staff, you are an important voice of the museum. All the voices are important in the museum. We'll begin with that. We want, of course, to work on, uh, with our staff also to have them more involved into the collection, into the way of presenting things, giving their, uh, their opinion also about the exhibition. Well, you, we know, for example, which is very important for me, when I arrived seven years ago in the museum, I wanted to introduce contemporary art uh, in uh, in in uh, in a uh, in, uh, cross perspective, so uh, I'm I would say that a part of the curators were reluctant to do that and to have contemporary works of art also introduced into the collection because they are now part of our permanent collection. And what was very important that the st it was that the staff of the museum was a big support for me. So. It's a way of thinking that, of, of saying also that if you involve a broader audience, you can also bring into museums things that maybe would be more difficult if you rely only, I would say, on more classical, you know, members of the staff. So I do think we have to do that. We have created also a um, literature prize and we have invited people from our audience 
to be part of the jury of, the, of this prize. I think it's very important. Thank you, Sophie. Otone, is there another question for us? Yes. Um, there's a question for Reem and Thelma. What is the responsibility of the curator to the artist's voice and when the artist is deceased to the family? Reem, would you like to start? Yeah, um, I think that it, the question really states the answer. Um, you know, the curator has a huge responsibility to the artist. You know, I see curatorial work as acting, you know, in collaboration with artists, really being in service of being able to be an interlocutor between them, the object, and the audience in institutional or other settings. So that that responsibility is one of service and it's thinking of how one serves um, the vision of the artist and also intention. Um, I think that the collaborative aspect of that is where the responsibility comes from because it is not necessarily one of authorship, right? Bringing, the art, bringing a curator's ideas to an artist but working in service of a kind of shared intellectual conversation. I think when one is dealing with an artist um, who is deceased, then there is a responsibility to legacy. And that responsibility is not just to the artists in the work, but to creating the sort of moment of recognition of this artist's legacy um, in the past, but also creating a path for that legacy to continue in the future. Reem, did you have something to add? Uh, I mean, just to add on, uh, I completely agree with uh, Thelma's answer. And, and just to add um, that, you know, it's a continued, uh, it, the, the conversation with these artists is not just with the exhibition or with, um, um, at least in my case, I feel like I miss the artists. They're my, you know, extended community. The ones I not uh, had a conversation with in, in recent time, I feel I'm like, I, I feel I'm severed from something that, you know, I, I, I'm unaware of their growth, of, of factors of their life. Um, and, and, and that's something that is really important for the living artist. In terms of the deceased artists, I would say, so just to say it's a continued conversation with the deceased artist, it's absolutely, you know, incorporating, uh, uh, for example, in our case now working on the Shaba show, we've involved the estate of the daughter of Muhammad Shaba is involved as part of the curatorial committee. Uh, we have multiple experts. It's not just one voice, but multiple experts that are uh, curating the exhibition. And that's something that, you know, this is how much we can be faithful to that legacy as Thelma pointed out. Great, thank you. Otone, another we question? Have a few que yeah, we have a few questions about storages. So there's one that says, how do you feel about opening storages to the public? Is it worthwhile for educational purposes or is it a burden for the budget? How to use works in storage so they do not remain unseen forever? And similarly, we have a question um, about uh, the value of collections in storage and how can we uh, make sure that they're not just there uh, purely so that they're preserved for future generations. So, anyone like that? If I, yeah, if I may start for the, the question of the storage, which is really uh, for me a, a, a question which is, um, you, you see the storage are not empty spaces. You have always lived or lived around the storage because of course uh, the, the elements that you have into the storage can be studied. You have a lot of researchers coming from here. That's why it's really important to keep this artwork on the historical aspect. The other aspect of, um, and you know that you have some museums, for instance, that have uh, this uh, viewable storage, and you can see what happens behind the, behind the scene. Uh, you have a lot of restoration happening into the storage, and these are as well technical spaces. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, you add dead spaces into a museum. These elements are really important just uh, to be a part of this life aspect of a museum. So um, you have a life behind the, behind the scene as well. What happens at DIA, Jessica? I mean, I don't yeah. even know how much storage you have. Well, I, we're somewhat unusual in that the majority of our collection is on display. And in fact, um, we really do try to only acquire thinking of um, exhibition making displays, et cetera. So um, 
uh, our storage is maybe slightly disappointing, <laughs> but uh, there are, um, I, I was also sort of visually going through my head of walking through our storage as Rosemary was talking about it as this active space and thinking, I don't know how interesting it always is to, to look at lots of crates either. Um, but I think the, the practice of having these kind of open storage projects can be absolutely fascinating, totally, because of course they reveal the histories that we're precisely not showing. I mean, I think anybody who's worked in institutions, I mean, now I've, I've worked in many of them, but but having the, the access to go through these, you know, whether it's pulling out the painting racks or, or you know, searching, I mean, going to other museums when you're, you're visiting a work for an exhibition and seeing everything else, which suddenly seems so much more interesting than the thing that you went to see. It's totally fascinating because these are the, the hidden histories. These are the things that we have, for whatever reason, decided were not so important to show quite often. Um, and they're the, precisely the places where you can begin to have this kind of, uh, you know, reawakening and, and, and curiosity. I think one of the things we haven't talked about today, which I think is just so important and speaks to to really very much what, what Thelma and Reem have been speaking about is this the, the significance of curiosity in our field. I suppose it comes back to what I was saying about learning on the job, you know, not questioning the stories, questioning the histories, always going back to dig deeper. I mean, Reem, Reem is like an outstanding example of this in her curatorial work, but how do we dig deeper? How do we not accept that given history? And how do we go back to these collections and look at them with fresh eyes, which perhaps again comes back to training and needing people who do not come with this you know, authoritative, authoritative canon, but but come and say, this is fascinating. Where did it come from? Who made it? Who are they? How, why do we not know about them? You know, how do they fit within our history? Um, so I think it's a great question about storage. Um, I encourage, you know, all, all the, the students who are on this call too, like go in where, where they're available on museums, websites, go through those lists of works. I go through Thalma's collection all the time. It's an amazing resource, the, the Studio Museum, yeah collection list. I mean, th these are extraordinary resources and they lead you to all kinds of thoughts, ideas, experiences, research strands. Uh, if, what, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. No, go no ahead. I just wanted to say that during the lockdown, we have made small videos uh, in a very unprofessional way, I must say, but I do think it's also a part of the charm of it. And we call it uh, Gimme Underground. And uh, I, um, during the first lockdown, I was in the museum every day. I, I went walking and we had small videos made in the storage. And so I used to lead the, the audience uh, to the storage, presenting all the way the storage was organized, or a precise uh, work of art in the museum, in this in the museum storage, and it was a big su success. So we are still doing the smaller uh, uh, videos now because people are very fond of that, about, about not knowing more about what is under our feet, the behind the scenes aspect of it. And I guess that just speaks to the importance of increased digitization and different uh, platforms of access. And I have to well, say, I'm completely. very intrigued with even the idea of placing, you know, showing the art within the storage spaces. I love the idea. I've always been a proponent of, you know, how do we show within our lived experiences, right? Like, how are we representing art as a living mechanism? So it's it's a fascinating, it's a great idea. Um, you know, um, it's something definitely for us to channel and think about, and it gives m more access and uh, I want to say even a rudimentary feeling of like, um, uh, uh, you know, the mechanisms that we are uh, uh, applying for the museum. So and it makes it, yes, a living space. And I, I'm not one for like white boxes and, you know, <laughs> white walls. Uh, a lot who know me will know that I will always, you know, endorse using all of these kind of um, various lived experiences as places where we are showing the art uh, to make it as much as public as possible. Thank you, Reem. And storage really re represents real possibility in our institutions, but it's also a snapshot of the thoughts and the wishes and aspirations of the curators and directors who came before us. You know, when I spend time in the storage at the Studio Museum, I see what the curators in the 70s who saw the museum in those early days as a direct assault 
on the exclusion of Black artists and their way of collecting in that moment as a way to write a history that hadn't been written. I look at it in the 80s and the 90s, and then, of course, in the 20 years I've I've been there. So I do think storage and seeing our collections not displayed in exhibition, right, the fully thought out narratives, but seeing them displayed in storage in the way that they're held gives you a real sense of an institution through its history. Yeah, it, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Tony, I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Yep, uh, there are many questions. I'm terribly sorry for all the ones that we won't be able to answer. There's one that kind of comes in parallel. Um, there's one that says, how would you uh, invite talented brains from new generations that see the future differently to bring them inside your institutions to break your institution walls? And similarly, you know, if the curator today requires these new skill set you're talking, could you reimagine what would be the skill set of the curators in 2030? Well, it builds on, on things we've talked about before. What about 2030? Do you think uh, you can foresee <laughs> significant change uh, taking place and what might that look like? Well, I hope so. I think we all probably want to see the institutional world transform and therefore the skill sets transform. I'm not going to be one to predict into it necessarily exactly what it is, but simply to say that should be the aspiration. You know, I think in terms of, you know, how do we um, engage young people? You know, I have the real privilege of the Studio Museum was my first job when I graduated from college before I went off to work elsewhere. So to come back at this moment, um, first as Chief Curator and then Director, really has given me the sense of that path and how I came into the institution as a young person, seeing what perhaps my voice could be and using that as a way that led me through the field. So I think that perhaps in thinking about, um, it was to your point, Andrew, I think what that question really is, is a charge to the field to open it itself to these young voices, to the curators who will be the voices in 2030 with these new skills that aren't yet apparent to us now. Excellent. I'd, I'd add to that too, Thama. Um, I, I think that's such a great way of putting it, but, um, but also to hope for um, difference of institutions. You know, we're, we're, we're looking, we want specificity. We want to see, you know, radically different institutions. We don't want to visit the same space and have a yeah. weird sense of, you know, visiting what you saw and, and, you know, nobody wants Abu Dhabi to be the same as the Paris, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we specifically want to see difference. That's, mm. I think, a, a really important thing to hold on to. Mm. I totally agree about that. I think it, what is important is not to reproduce the same model, is to have a, 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 a multi multi-centered model. If, if you have only one, one definition of museum, the big risk is really to try to reproduce the same thing. Let's be inventive. Yeah, I fully agree. I really liked it, Salma when you made this, uh, this sign about, uh, you know, which is remind, reminding me of the agile method, which is more a kind of processing because we are processor. And uh, yes, this future is just a, a fantastic we could imagine it, but there are so many futures possible. And uh, yeah. I'd love to see the museum as that active space. I mean, I'm trying to think of like rooms that are filled with people working and debating uh, and, and, you know, the art is hung around them, but, you know, there's more to, to a life of activity. Maybe there are laboratories there. Maybe the storage is within the museum itself. You know, we have piled works out there in rooms, but, you know, and certain displays, maybe you have a tech lab with designers and artists in another room. I want to see, you know, that kind of vibrancy. I want to see that youth language that I'm still trying to get accustomed to. I mean, that would be something to look forward to. In the we are out of time, but the way you ended, I think, gives us so much our excitement and hope about what is to come on the other side of this global pandemic. So keep up the great work and thanks so much for, for your views and, and your perspectives today and uh, be well, stay well. Thank you.